with me this morning. We're going to read uh, a passage from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and we tradition in the church is to stand for the reading of the gospel or the scripture. We are pragmatic. We are believers, church tradition. Uh, so sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't. But there's something about uh, sort of focusing our body and our mind together in worship and in reading of scripture. So this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, which is really the peak of the Bible, Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read a very short passage here. Uh, two passages, in fact, about retaliation and love for your enemies in Jesus' teaching uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. So hear these words, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this is Jesus speaking to the crowds and multitude. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, give him your coat also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. And then he gives another teaching segment here. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be like your father in heaven. Since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do the same, don't they? And if you only greet your brothers, what more do you do? Even the Gentiles do the same, don't they? So then be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today. For your word, we thank you that you are calling us into making sure that we continue to put you at the center. When so many ideologies of the left, right, and other ways want to pull us and suck us and pull us away from you, we, we want to recenter ourselves on you that we might be a blessing in this earth, working for uh, salvation and deliverance and Jesus y justice on the earth, declaring that the kingdom of God is coming in its fullness and is broken in already in you. And so, Lord, may we live into the power of the Easter miracle this day in Jesus' name. And if you're willing to say amen or amen, amen, you can be seated this morning. <clears throat> Two friends, Bill and Tom, were drinking at an all-night cafe, and they got into a discussion about the difference between irritation, anger, and rage. Irritation, anger, and rage. About 1 a.m., when all human wisdom is at its peak, <laughs> Bill said, look, Tom, I'll show you an example of irritation. This is an old story, so he went to a pay phone, and he put in a coin. I've seen a few of those still exist in Canada. And he dialed a number at random. And the phone rang and rang and rang, and finally there was a sleepy voice at the other end, and Bill said, I'd like to speak to Jones. There is no one here by the name Jones, the disgruntled man replied as he hung up. That, Bill said to Tom, is a man who is irritated. <laughs> About an hour later at 2 a.m. when human wisdom really, really reaches its peak, Bill said, now I'll show you a man who is angry. He went to the phone, redialed the same number, let it ring, and eventually the same sleepy voice answered the phone. And Bill asked, may I speak with Jones? There's no one here by name Jones. Again, angry reply. And the man, louder, slams down the receiver on the other end, old phones. And an hour later at 3 a.m., clearly these people should have gone home by now. I don't know what's wrong with this place, establishment. Bill said, now I'm going to show you an example of rage. He went to the phone, dialed the same number, let it ring. And when the sleepy man finally answered, Bill said, Hi, this is Jones. Have there been any calls for me? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. I'll stick with my preaching profession and leave the comedy to others. Okay. Okay, that was, that was a little... That, oh, oh, oh. Woo, woo. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was unnecessary roughness right there. Uh, this Sunday and next Sunday, we want to talk about uh, power. And how, as believers, in a Jesus-centered way of being, we want to have a different relationship with power. And power overlaps oftentimes with things like anger and rage. Uh, if you hate your enemy, you love your enemy, you're expressing anger towards, and Jesus calls us to a different way. 
And we're using some material that's been put together by uh, a Greg Boyd, a pastor theologian uh, in, a, in what was a Baptist church in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Also, Leanne Friesen, who is uh, a part of a Baptist church in Ontario. In fact, Leanne Friesen is also their church as part of the Canadian Baptist of, West, of, of, of Canadian Masters of Ontario and Quebec. And uh, she is also part of something called Jesus Collective, so fully part of a Baptist denomination and also the network Jesus Collective. And she has been elected to be the uh, executive minister for the Canadian Baptist of Ontario and Quebec. And so kind of interesting because I'm doing something similar with a different uh, group that's also connected in this sort of third way as well. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing material from them and others as well, some stuff from Timothy Keller, John Piper, Ken Shigematsu, um, and talking about this idea of what do we do with power and how should we look at power differently. This relationship with power is important to understand because as followers of Jesus, we are called to critique and understand power and relate to it in a new way of self-sacrificial love. Now, I want to give a caveat and say there are times when we push back prophetically, but we find different ways to do that, different ways of relating to power, particularly in places where we've been oppressed. But the general principle that we want to dig into and then layer in some information about is this idea that evil is ultimately overcome when we do things that break out of the vicious cycle of returning eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, as we read this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, in Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, there are 14 Uh, what we might call triads, where Jesus lists a traditional religious righteousness, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He names what happens if we keep doing that, a vicious cycle, and and, and what happens if we follow the path of traditional quote-unquote righteousness, and how it makes us poorer and, and, and less more like God desires for humanity. And then he gives us an alternative to break out of the cycle of offense, traditional righteousness, and breaking out of that vicious cycle by doing something transforming that will change the dynamic instead of simply repaying evil for evil, violence for violence, anger for anger, and break out of it and let God's holiness and Holy Spirit righteousness begin to reign in a different way in our lives. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, there are 14 of these, and throughout the Matthew is structured in this way. I think there's something like 70, 70 some of these throughout the book of Matthew. And when I learned this in studying and research over the years, and remember reading Kingdom Ethics by a guy named Glenn Stassen and uh, David Gushy, it transformed my own spiritual journey to begin to see that, in fact, we are given a different way of being really practical things that break us out of these cycles. Because otherwise, we just come into the church, we say yes to Jesus, maybe we're responding to the Holy Spirit, the community, whatever it is that's drawing us in, and we forget that Jesus actually gives us a different way of living. So when we say we want to be Jesus-centered, when we align with groups that are trying to remind the church in North America that Jesus' centricity is what we desperately need to experience revival and a new re-reformation in our churches in North America, we're talking about following the ways of Jesus in very practical ways. How do we break the cycles that we so easily fall back into? In fact, our age is characterized by intensing intensifying polarization. And by the way, I'm going to spend this Sunday, next Sunday, and maybe one more Sunday on this because this is so important and I get real preachy on this stuff because it's just the Holy Spirit just moves me. You just, you just pull it out of me. The people just pull it out of me. Just pull it out of me. Look at your neighbor and say, I think he's lying. Okay. <laughs> I confess my sins. <laughs> We've fallen into echo chambers In fact, I was reading an article this morning about more and more research says that now as social medias have becoming less dominant, but our private chat groups, whether we're on uh, whatever private chat groups, whether it's Discord, in fact, the the article was about the the, uh, soldier in the US, the 21-year-old who was on a Discord chat, which is a a software where you can have these closed chat groups, was sharing and was basically one-upping having a male pride contest about the information he had because of his low station but high access to information in the U.S. military spilling all of these uh, government secrets on there was bragging to his buddies on Discord and that's how there's this huge universal or or global scandal about U.S. intelligence because of the inward group chat one-upping one another in that. And we do this now all the time with our social media. It's less on the public stuff and more on the smaller groups. We get into groupthink and we feed one another and we feed off of one another and we see more and more echo chambers and polarization across the world because of this. And we see governments wrestling with, well, how do we manage this? What do we do with this? Political dialogue used to mean in a democratic context, used to mean in places like Canada, about finding common ground for the good of the common good of the whole. 
But now it's degenerated to mostly being about defeating the opposing side. I've been listening to Canadian Parliament. As a new Canadian, I've been listening. Oh my goodness, Jesus, help me. I've uh, been listening to like Trudeau respond to, is it Polé? I don't speak French. Yeah, yeah, like listening to these two go back and forth. Oh my goodness, holy cow. How are we going to get to common good with this nonsense? And, 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 well, I won't even say anything about the other parties. Since I'm so new, I'll probably say something horrible and then have to repent and do public apologies. But <laughs> it's degenerated to being mostly about defeating the opposing side. They no longer are reasonable with fellow citizens. And in some cases, even family members with whom we happen to disagree. We are increasingly seeing one another as enemies of the state or destroyers of democracy or simply as evil and so we also see escalating violence in the public discourses across the world and even often translating into violent action. The threats to political leaders have spiked. In places like the United States, there's even talk of civil war. But FYI, as someone who has immigrated from that country to Canada, there's always talk of civil war in the United States at various points. So there actually was a real civil war at one point, which was good because there was the awful evil of slavery that needed to be, it, it needed to be vanquished. Uh, but still a long ways to go on so many issues of justice. But this violence permeating our cultures happens in many ways as well. For example, in the U.S. in 2022, they averaged over two mass shootings per day. Children as well as teachers have been terrorized and murdered in the classrooms. Even recently we see that happen. But lest those of us who are Canadian or adopted Canadians become too snarky, which is a Canadian sin, oh my goodness, a uh, whole other sermon on that, we have seen stabbings on transit here in Vancouver. We have seen gang violence here. You don't need to have access to guns to still act out violently, and it is happening. We can disagree on how to deal with the homeless situation in, in downtown Eastside and, and people, unhoused people. I'm still learning the correct language. I'm, I'm always a little behind on my politically correct language, so no offense intended. The unhoused folks and how they've been treated. And as much as some of us who come from pull you up from the bootstraps kind of thing, and I'm not a highly, my heart is not wired that way uh, because of what my background, but, but uh, the, the, the violent removal of people that have no other homes and where are they going? Are we, have we done new institutionalization? Have we built new housing? Like there, sometimes we think the violent solution and we rename it and we gloss it up and we put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Here in Canada, again, we see this going on and in our city. Governments are the worst perpetrators of mass violence. In fact, with governments, we sanctify it and we say, oh, it is the will of God. No, it is not. Nuclear weapons eliminating the planet, that's the will of God who created in his image and likeness every human being? I don't think so. But our concern as kingdom people and about violence needs to be about our humans. It needs to be about our planet, creation, care, and stewardship. And the well-being of all that lives should be on our hearts Violence is anything that violates the intrinsic worth of something. And this is a key Christian thing that cuts across capitalism, communism, all other isms and ideologies. One of the core Christian values is that life has intrinsic worth because it is a gift of the creator and we cannot give it back. And this is important. Womb to tomb, creation, people, everything, that life has intrinsic value because it is created and endowed by God to have that value. And this is where we wrestle and we need to wrestle with systems, whether they are politics, church systems, whatever, and none of them do incredible justice. So we have to lean into that while holding the kingdom values of God above the kingdom of the world values. And we critique and we look at world values based on this bias towards the preservation of life. God is grieved and people end up falling under judgment when we violate the worth of others, our creation that we've been set into. And scripture is filled again with passages that instruct us not only to care for one another, but to care for creation, for animals, for the environment. And we can disagree politically on how it's the best way to go about that. But what we cannot deny is that scripture talks about that God created this earth, God created animals, God created human beings, and he declared that they are good and we have a role to play as wise stewards of all life. But what often drives us down the ditch of wanting to reject this idea and use power in a way that is destructive, that tears down others. Well, oftentimes this lust for power is rooted in the desire to protect ourselves, for example. The coercive power to protect ourselves. And I will unpack more of this this day and next Sunday, but also the power to advance our self-interests. We want to have power also to defeat 
who we see as our enemies and impose our will on others and of course power to manipulate nature to our own advantage as well. And this lust for power is found in individuals, it's found in social groups, it's found in institutions, corporations, and nations. And most of the violence towards humans and the earth is a direct result of our longing for this power over to try to control situations, to try to enforce our order, our control on it. In church, we can slip into this as well. I'm accountable to our elder board here. Our elder board is elected by our members. They're accountable ultimately to the members of the church. We tried to build in within believers' church tradition, power checks up and down the thing. And yet we know that abuses of power still happen even when we work at uh, systems and governmental systems that have checks in them against anyone accumulating too much power. A pastor friend of mine from uh, Sarasota who's sort of a uh, Baptist-y, neo-Anabaptist type Chip Bennett uh, said, wrote this the other day about leadership and ministry, and I loved it. And I just want to share it with you about this idea of a different relationship with power. He said, in ministry, there are some things that I have learned over and over again, and this is good. Find the ones who look for a towel over the ones looking for a title. Did you hear that this morning? Find the people looking for a towel to serve for the ones looking for a title. Whew, that preaches. Find the ones who genuinely care about people and who have to be pushed onto the platform. Oh, Jesus, help us. Especially as our church moves into a season of pastoral search, find the ones who genuinely care about people and who have to be pushed onto the platform. Find the ones who bring solutions, not just problems. Oh, man, I could preach messages on that. I can find anybody to shoot arrows at me in a church all day long. I could stand out on the street corner and say, tell me what you don't like about the church, and I can guarantee you I'd get some feedback from the neighbors. Any Yahoo can shoot and, and rip and tear, but who is going to bring solutions to the table and who is willing to say, not only that, I will commit to doing something about it. Woo! Those people, Jesus, bring more of them. Hallelujah. Be that kind of person. <laughs> Find ones who will serve anywhere rather than throw a fit when they don't get what they want. Whew. I could tell story after story after story. Find ones who say to others what they say to you. Find ones who say to others what they say to you. Be the bearer of good gossip. Find the ones, and we don't get it right. I mean, every one of us is, is indicted by something in this list. Find the ones who ministered from, oh, this, this, this right here. You want to change your dynamic in your relationship with power? Find people who minister from healed brokenness, not from their current brokenness. Let me, let me say that one again who minister from healed brokenness. If you're still wounded and oozing, you need to experience healing, whatever it takes, deliverance, prayer, counseling, therapy, medicine, whatever it takes, you need to work through that because if you're not healing your brokenness, you will wound other people. Hurt people continue to hurt people. Healed people, healed wounded people know the pain and know their pride is knocked down where it needs to be. They're in a position to serve and love others in a way that those that are still either think everything's fine or have not healed cannot do. That's so good. Find the people who stay who engage in relationship, find the ones who pray rather than pray. Well, let me say that again. Find the people who pray and intercede and lift up others before the Lord versus those who are seeking to see who can I, who can I knock down a notch, who can I devour, who can I be a praying on as a lion. Two more he has in his list. Find the ones who will put their giftedness aside because they know nothing can keep God from eventually using them in their giftedness. In the old time, our charismatic church, we had this, this, this saying... And it had problems, it needed checks and balances, of course, but your gift will make its way eventually. Find those that are willing to lay aside their giftedness and let God, let that gift make its way. It will make its way. It will create its space to be used. Life finds a way, as it were. And find the ones you have to search out due to their humility, not the ones telling you that you are missing God by not promoting them. Chip Bennett, Grace Community Church, Sarasota, good stuff. I want to say this about power. Power can be seen in a neutral way, right? Are you still with me? Are you guys still, you're very quiet this morning. Are you just awake, amen? Okay, okay, I'm just preaching to myself. It's okay, it's okay. I almost wanted to say, what are you gonna do, fire me? Too early, too early, too soon, too soon, too soon. Still too sore, okay, okay. Jesus help him. Uh, you just reach out your hand and say, Jesus help him. <laughs> Jesus help him, pray. Demons out, in Jesus' name, all right. 
power that is unchecked and power that is used to force instead of invite and make space for others to participate. There's power that's unchecked. We should not create systems with unchecked power. And I think this is a problem with so many world governments is they want to concentrate more and more power. But power that is unchecked, that is a danger. If there is no accountability, there's no way to call anything into account on, beware. Red flags ought to be flying everywhere on that. That kind of power will be abusive power, coercive power. And again, use to force, coerce instead of invite participation. Sure, we should use the power. And every one of us has some form of power at some level. And the more power you have in a situation or more perceived power, to use David Fitch's language, you have a responsibility to be more self-sacrificial, as it were. You have the responsibility to make sure that you submit first, that you put yourself, um, I submit to you, how do you see this? And then you would let yourself be invited into the conversation. And I've had to practice this again and again. And I've been in situations where I've had more power and I've had less power or perceived power or not. It may not be real power, but perceived We use our power to invite people in. When you're leading a small group, if you're a small group facilitator, you have power in that group, for example. And you should be the one that isn't doing all the talking, but you should invite others in. I did that and I was just teaching a class this morning where I was doing all the talking. Okay, different situation, teaching. But you invite in the participation in the home church. You say, you know, I have not heard, uh, I've not heard from Tyler yet in this group. And so the leader, I'm not asking you to say anything right now. Don't look at me like that. My my life was just threatened by the look that went past his face. (laughs) I feel coercion. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, I'm just kidding, Tyler. I'm just messing with you, brother. Uh, But for example, if he's in my group and, and I'm the one facilitating, I want to draw out. Like there's real simple applications to major applications in our culture. But what about power beyond physical power? Physical power, positional power is a symptom or outflow often of spiritual power, mental power. God also speaks of God's power at work in us. And, I, and I'm, I'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, in Ephesians 1, 17, he says this. I keep asking, Paul's praying for the Ephesians. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, that there's a different way of being and the church is one way that we live into this kingdom. We are like outposts of the kingdom of God, different way of wrestling with power in life as a people and is in incomparably great power for us who believe that power. Now, when you say yes to Jesus, you receive power from the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God power at work within you. He said, the power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. This passage here talks about this idea that you have been given power from the Lord. If you are a follower of Jesus, his spirit lives within you. And the thing about God's power, unlike how we humans think about power, is it is limitless. It is not a zero-sum game where Tyler has to give some power to me and he loses some power when he does that, or I give power to Tyler, however that works, and I lose power in that. But in God's power is at work in each one of his children, directly by the Holy Spirit, believers' church tradition, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that we have an unlimited source of somebodyness, of who we are in him. And when you begin to realize that, that can change how we function as a church too. We have this sense that we can seek the Lord for empowerment, both to do tasks and to live into this kingdom of God, Sermon on the Mount way of being, that the Spirit grants us power for this. But what are the methods to that power? What are the ways to that power? Well, the ways are pray, submission to one another and community, the word of God, discerning well together. But ultimately, it's cultivating that relationship, that conversation with God and saying, Holy Spirit, fill me anew, empower me with your presence. Help me to to flow not only relationally with you, but with that sense of agency and somebodyness that I have regardless of how much money's in my bank account, regardless of which neighborhood or where I live in Vancouver, regardless of what I come, my culture, my family of origin, there is a direct empowerment of the Spirit of God, a good kind of kingdom power that we are called to operate in. Now, it can be twisted and distorted, of course. Paul corrects a lot of this in his 2 Corinthians uh, letter. But that is a gift of the Lord to the believer. We need to understand there are various sources of other power in our lives, our culture, our ethnicity, our family, our nation, our acquired skills, our experiences, our trades, our education, our networks in and beyond 
the one we were born into. Physical power, life and death, spiritual power. The Bible reminds us in Ephesians that we are to submit to one another, though. That if we're going to exercise power in a kingdom way, we submit to one another. We self-sacrifice. We love outrageously, even in the face of those that are working against the cross purposes of what Jesus would want. Okay, I've got a lot more I want to say, but I think I'm going to... Uh, well, let me just say a little more on that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause it. Let me say a little more. A little more, a little more. We're not going to do communion today, so we're, we're good. Uh, a little more. Uh, and I think this is from Richard Foster. And Richard Foster talks about this idea of how we relate to money, sex, and power. And we'll talk more about money, sex, and power in this sort of third one here in this sermon series. He says, you have a choice. You can be enslaved by something where it owns you, money, sex, and power. Power owns you. You are driven by it. You are, dri- you are for it. It, it is driving everything in your life. And you do whatever it is to seek after it. And you follow it, you know, like a rat after cheese. I don't know. Okay, that's not in the notes. But, you know, you're, you're like, you're, like it, you're enslaved by it. It owns you. The second thing that our world seeks after is to be a master, to own it through our own knowledge, our skills, and experiences, and our own boundaries, and our own bounded mindset. We master it. We control it. But we are called as kingdom citizens to move from enslaved by money, sex, and power to move from being mastered or master of it to stewardship mindset. Say it with me, stewardship. We are called to be stewards. And we begin to shift our mindset. And yes, God has given me this, but everything is a gift ultimately. And gifts are not just for the person receiving it. It's also something that we share as we receive God's superabundance in our lives for the flourishing of others. And when we move into this servant, this steward mindset, mind, mindset rather, um, it shifts how we relate to things like power. So, mm, I really, I, I was preaching good. Now I'm only on one, I should be farther along in my notes, but it's, it's all right, it's all right. Jesus is here, amen? <laughs> amen. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to look and act differently. And we to understand that peace, peace is something that comes if the power of the cross And our power is shaped by the cross and resurrection as followers of Jesus, as we've already talked about. So violence is the twin brother of coercive power. Violence, and Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says that how we use our words, how we do this thing, we can also display this kind of uh, evil, that that when we think ill of our brother or sister, that we are uh, exercising a form of violence, coercive power. But peace is the brother, the twin brother of the power of the cross. And how do we implement more of that self-sacrificial love? And that's what I want to get into, and I will pause, and I will get into more of that next Sunday. But let me leave you with some final application points here. I'm going to uh, zoom through my notes. Oh, I've preached all, much of this already, but okay. Let me summarize some things before we pause this morning. We'll pick up on a different way, self-sacrificial love of relating to power. The first thing we need to understand and remind as we, as we leave today or prepare to leave today is this. As God's beloved children, you are called and empowered to imitate God by loving others the way Christ loves us and gave his life for us. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 speaks about this. That God demonstrates his love for us by taking action. So Jesus' followers ask this question, what loving action can we do individually and collectively towards others who are within our sphere of influence? You want to start operating differently. Let love define your power. How can I act towards someone? What action can I take towards someone that is loving? So we want to encourage to look for opportunities to serve our people and our neighbors, to develop relationships, specifically also with those that are more disempowered, either in our minds or in our culture's eyesight, whether they're lonely or grieving or hungry hungry or homeless or marginalized, oppressed or otherwise in need. We want to be the people that take the power of God into the edges, whatever the edges may look like in our lives and in our neighborhoods. We are called to walk in love. That will check our power and make sure that we're looking at it through the lens of Christ and we are being self-sacrificial. We are called to walk in love as part of our life of Jesus. That means, for example, we have to love people by setting aside whatever negative judgments that person may trigger in us and simply agreeing with God that every person you encounter is of unsurpassable worth, that God paid the unsurpassable price for them, And we need to learn to pray pray blessings in our daily life. 
In fact, this week when someone irritates you, when someone is acting like an enemy towards you, when some situation is out of hand, I challenge you to consider right there in their mind and may the Holy Spirit remind you of this to pray, oh God, bless them. And Lord, if I'm supposed to speak a word of encouragement or love or care or do something, uh, God, give me the strength to follow through with that by the power of your Holy Spirit. You start walking like that in this world, whew, may get you crucified, but it will also transform society one person at a time. Secondly, I want to remind you this morning, we don't get good at anything if we don't practice. And we'll talk more about this enemy love piece of the Sermon on the Mount next Sunday. I'll pick up with that. That's kind of where I stopped in the, in the message today. But we'll talk more about this because when we read, Jer- when we read um, not Jeremiah, when we read Jesus saying here, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, he's taking Old Testament righteousness from Torah and he's saying there's another way to break out of a vicious cycle. And I'm telling you that if you do this transforming initiative, it has the potential to change the environment and turn an enemy towards someone less of an enemy and maybe even into someone who was an oppressor now becoming someone who is a friend and being redeemed and walking in justice. But here's the thing, we have to flex our enemy love muscle. We'll talk more about that next Sunday. It's not automatic because we have been trained. We have been trained to be enemy making machines. And unfortunately, the AI, social media, and closed group chats have made it worse through groupthink and echo chambers. We have been trained, we're being trained even more and more to be enemy making machines, polarization splitting. Why is that? Well, generally, I think it's because there's a power at work in the world that's evil, that Satan is at work in the world, and Satan's desire is to steal, kill, and destroy. And to do that, if he can turn neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, sister against sister, nation against nation, people against people, that's exactly what they do. Why is nationalism can go, why can patriotism be a good thing at a low level, but nationalism becomes demonic? Because it is an enemy making machine, it is a directly contradicts the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so we have to learn to reprogram ourselves, the power of God. We have to learn to do this through practice. The daily practice of praying for individuals or groups who would be the easiest for you to hate and the hardest for you to love, God bless them. For Canadians, you can start with Americans. Find an American and do that. In prayer, agree with God that these people were worth Jesus dying for you. It doesn't mean you're agreeing with their actions. It doesn't mean you're sanctifying all the stuff that they've done, particularly if it's unjust, unloving, and sinful. No. But about their worth, their inherent worth. We are to be those that bless. We are to be those that walk this world differently. Jesus, you felt that that American, I'm using that as a light joke because there's much harder things that we could name, but Lord, I pray that you bless them (laughs) and all their craziness. You can confess stuff with the Lord too. He can handle it. But but pray for blessing. But think about that person in your life right now that you need to pray a blessing over. If you want more of that list, become a pastor. Uh, You will have people that make you the enemy all day long. (laughs) Oh, Jesus, they are your beloved child, but I'm having problems with them, Lord. (laughs) Bless them, Father. Bless them. Help them uh, to see me differently, to see you differently, to see themselves differently. Yes, amen. Also remember the the third thing here is Jesus died to create one new humanity by tearing down the dividing wall of hostility. Ephesians 2 uh, verses 13 through 18, the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And by implication, that means all conflicting tribes and ethnic groups, that a, that a healthy kingdom church is going to be multicultural, mini cultural, and we got to constantly lean into this stuff. That doesn't mean we privilege one over the other. It doesn't mean that we privilege German culture or Chinese cultures or whoever culture uh, or Portuguese culture. Lots of Portuguese here. I know there's a couple of you here. Okay, okay. But rather that we lean into this, we wrestle with it, we submit to one another in love. And whoever is perceived with more power needs to go first in those conversations when it gets hot about things that may relate to how we're seeing things differently. In Revelation, we're given a vision of God's kingdom that includes a great multitude, Revelation 7, 9, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So we need to intentionally cultivate relationships that cross ethnic, national, social, economic, political lines. And we need to encourage disciples to use whatever privilege their ethnicity or gender may afford them to become allies with those who may have less power or perceived power in the situation. And the final application point is this. And worship team, come on up because I need you to lead us in a song. We've got to sing our way out of this mess that I've preached us into. And we will continue for the next Sunday for sure. The New Testament defines agape, this God-like love, by pointing to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. 1 John 
3.16. We love to the degree that we are willing to sacrifice for the well-being of the other. So what do we need to maybe consider laying down in order to love well? What do you need to lay down to love someone well? Where have I, where have you, where have we used whatever power we have in a way that's coercive power over that does not show the kingdom of God, but simply tries to put Jesus' peanut butter on top of our old way of thinking and being? And this is a lifelong process of discipleship. And yet if we take Jesus seriously and we believe uh, that he died and he rose again on the third day and we, and we confess the empowerment of the Holy Spirit when he says these things in the Sermon on the Mount, he's calling us to show another way of being human on the earth. He's giving us the power. He's giving us the assignment. But so often we just wash our hands and say, I'm going to go back to how whatever I learned in my family, whatever I learned before, we must lean into this to be Jesus-centered. That's one of the things it means in pointing your arrow towards Jesus is how am I learning to walk in this self-sacrificial love? of Calvary. Because you know what? The ideologies, the nationalisms, the tearing down in the world, the ideological camps, all of that, isn't that just a horrible, tiresome burden to bear? Don't you want a better humanity, a better experience? Well, the scandalous claim of our faith is that there is only one way to get there, and it is through Jesus' life, death, and teachings. And as much as we see those throughout other religions and other systems, we can say, praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit is at work everywhere. But if you have claimed Jesus and Jesus has claimed you, you particularly have an assignment to do this. And with his assignment comes his empowerment. So would you stand with me this morning as we conclude this part of the different relationship with power of being followers of Jesus? And you say, well, is this... Does this align with our theology and our beliefs? Absolutely. I don't know if you've read through the NAB Statement of Beliefs, but read through it. If you haven't read through the New Testament, read through it. If you, if you want to start somewhere, start with the Gospel of John or start with the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. This is central to Christianity. In fact, when Christianity goes off the rails after the first couple centuries where it became part of the empire or where the empire wanted to baptize Christianity is when it gets a little, little testy. And I say the Holy Spirit's always at work. I don't believe in the complete fall of the church. But I do believe that we get delayed and we get pushed aside as we get our, our eyes on human power that seems like a quicker fix, but gets us right back into the same position of needing redemption, needing our eyes opened to see a different way of living. So let's pray together this morning. Lord, I thank you that you are at work in this church. And that we are a pilgrim people, we are on the journey. But may that journey be constantly pointing that our arrow back towards you, Jesus. Your cross, your cruciform love, your self-sacrificial love. And God, forgive us when we have looked at the human modes of power over and thought, well, that's a quicker way to get what I want, not realizing that whatever you use will also shape you and deform you according to what's in it. And so God, forgive us and help us to repent and to turn again towards your teachings, towards your call to this different way of being, to living in relationship with the enemy in our lives, whatever that enemy may be. Not embracing, not saying that what it is is all good, but rather recognizing that how things are changed is through outrageous love, that outrageous love breaks the cycle. Or as Paul says in Galatians 2, be careful how you Go to a brother so that you too aren't pulled into that same sin on how you correct. Lord, thank you that you've empowered each person here. That you've died for each person here. That you rose for each person here and this creation and all that is. And so, Lord, we lean into the practice of self-sacrificial love this day.